fresh water in the hand. We feel good. We're gonna have a great show. We got some cool guests joining us. Brantford sliding in right now. You know what I'm saying? Just gotta get people. Absolutely, absolutely. Shout out to Chick Fil A. Um, they were a little late with our chicken, but it's all good. Now, <laughs> um, now I'm, I'm really happy to have you guys here today. You know, I really want to talk about Philadelphia, where it is, where it's going, what has been your experience growing your own careers here, your own aspirations and dreams. Um, and so, first to start, I'd love for you guys to give a little bit of background about what you, what exactly you do. And I'll start with you, Diamond. Start with me. Okay, so my name is Diamond Whipper Young, but I also go by D Whip. That's my artist name. I'm a visual artist. I've been doing art for more than half of my life now, so for a really long time, um, oil painting, sculptures. I'm also a curator as well, so I do art exhibitions, and yep. Dope, dope, dope. All right, so I am Gabrielle, and I am a model. I'm represented in New York, Miami, uh, Philadelphia, DC, Vegas, uh, I'm sure a bunch of other, oh, um, Atlanta. Yeah, a bunch of other places that I don't work in a ton, but yeah. Wow, I'm, I'm not a model. Um, I work for, for Live Nation, um, Vice President of Business Development and Operations, so really um, managing, developing events and platforms, specifically in hip hop, R&B, and gospel um, globally at this point. Yeah. And to, to give you guys some context as to like what this is exactly, so the WIL Take Ownership podcast is all about taking ownership of your mental, your economics, and your community. And so we constantly are talking to amazing people that are making shifts and cultural impact within their communities through the line of work that they do, or sometimes just through representation alone. Um, and so that's why we selected these three guests here, because we felt like they had amazing stories um, that could tie into you all in some way, um, and hopefully drop some tidbits of information that uh, you guys can leave here and feel empowered and inspired by. Um, but first for you guys, what has Philly meant to you as a, as a creator? I'll start with you, Gab. Okay, so Philly is kind of in a up and coming, it's an up and coming, up and coming city for artists pretty much. Um, it's soon hopefully going to be like the new Atlanta. Um, in the fashion industry, we've made- I see the look, yeah. Brandon, I got, I got it. We're gonna unpack it from Gab, Hi. I'm gonna throw it to you next though. Right, oh, you're next, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so Philly's kind of made that shift about 10, 15 years ago when in the fashion industry when Urban Outfitters was we found it here. Um, so Urban owns Free People and Anthropology, and it's pretty much put Philly on the map in the fashion world, only because Urban Outfitters is like the place to shop at right now. So um, since then, a bunch of other smaller um, designers, models, photographers have kind of started their way. Um, and Philly's a really good small knit city in that aspect where all the creatives know each other. So when you're first starting out, you have a ton of photographers, models, designers, stylists who are willing to help you. So it's a really cool place to figure out, you know, what your what your niche is. So um, yeah, pretty much. And then Brandon, I thought it's you, man. Um, for me, Philly is just. You know, we've been between, I was born and raised here, so we've been between New York and, and D.C., so we've always had a chip on our shoulder. But we're talking musically, creatively, there is not, to me, another city that really encompasses so much creativity. And I know Atlanta is Atlanta um, and, and other great cities. I just, there's something about Philly that, that I think is profound. And if you, in the industry, in, in the music industry, about 70 to 80 percent of touring musicians either have lived here, have been here, have developed their craft here. Um, and so Philly is just such a hotbed and, and such a, um, it's just such a, a great melting pot of creativity. Um, beyond, I can't say it's the new Atlanta, because it was here the before The fashion Atlanta. industry in is fashion, starting what, to right, become, fashion, not the music, fashion, I'm just fashion. In fashion, in fashion, in fashion. Can we curse on here? How, we, how does it work? You're good, you're good. Right. You could be real no, with it. I'm joking, go ahead. <laughs> Now you got a diamond. What does Philly mean? Um, so personally, Philly adopted me, and I'm so grateful for it. I love Philly for um, reasons they both said. In the art scene, it's like so rich in culture. Like it has so much depth. Like from the architecture to the music on the street to the people. And it's like, sometimes people that are from Philly say like, oh, you know, they have their negative feelings. But like, nonetheless, I genuinely feel brother and sisterly love in the city. Like, hands down. Like, if you need something, somebody might have a little grit to it. But at the end of the day, in Philly, I feel like people definitely have each other's back. And the creative 
economy is like booming. You know, like I I think is it, it could be better, but I definitely think like they both mentioned it's just a great place to cultivate things with like some soulful energy behind it. Do you want to hit on some of the cool products you've worked on in your career so far? Um, okay, so some things I've done in my career. All right, so here we go. Um, so one of my first um, big things I've done was working with the Urban League in um, LA. I've been out there twice. I worked with their event um, a few years back and recently I live painted at an event honoring Magic Johnson and his wife Cookie, so that was dope. I met Beyonce's mom. <laughs> So I was hyped about that. Um, one really cool thing I also did, I've done paintings for some celebrities like Common, Great Energy, um, Cardi B, Larry Fitzgerald, but I also really enjoyed working with the Philadelphia Mural Arts Program. And I think they are one of the organizations that make Philly Philly. Even from the start of it, it, like, it started as like young kids doing graffiti and somebody kind of redirected that energy to make murals. And it's like, that's what Philly is. Like it takes that grit, that grime, and like turns it into something so polished and beautiful, but still got the Philly swag, you know? Cause Philly's known for the murals. So um, yeah, those are just a few things. And I also curate my own art shows in Baltimore and Philadelphia. And I have to shout out Baltimore too, cause I, Philly adopted me, but Baltimore raised me, so I gotta get on that. <laughs> <laughs> and just to give a little context, so about a year ago, maybe a year and a half now, my grandfather passed away. And I was really close with him. I had been renting from him for about six years. And um, at that point in time, I know I wanted to commemorate him in some way. And so there's this photo that my mom and my aunt have with him. Um, and it's like in like four different spots of the house. Uh, and so I talked to Diamond about uh, painting it and bringing it to life. And uh, now it sits over my living room couch and commemorates him every single day. So uh, shout out to you and the amazing work you're doing and also the fact that your work allows people to live on. Um, so super love to that. Well, thank you for supporting me. I really do appreciate like artist to artist and just one thing about like those commissions, even though I say like this celebrity that's in LA, it's like pictures like that, like family memorabilia, that like person to person connection that really means the, mar the most in any art field, like music, fashion. So definitely that's important. That's love, that's love. Um, and then Brandon, you got you made some, some a big announcement recently, man. Y'all got got a big show coming up. I forgot what it's called. You want some like, light? Some it's, it's, it's called light. The, it's the Roots Picnic. <laughs> um, uh, I am one of the producers on that, and so that um, get it on sale, uh, please. It's on sale now. Get your tickets. Uh, but Broccoli City Music Festival, um, that's another one that we we co-produce, and a, a few other things. I don't I don't do the whole talking about it, but you know what we do is really develop events and platforms in hip hop, R and B, and gospel within Live Nation, huge global company, and you know they're very good at taking a Beyonce or taking a U2 and cutting a big. $200 million check. What they aren't good at is developing artists within uh, particular genres from the ground level, from ground level, excuse me, from clubs and theaters and grow them to amphitheaters and arenas. And so the, the purpose of Live Nation Urban was to develop, you know, artists and develop new platforms outside of the Coachellas and the Lollapaloozas of the world, but really cultivate you know, new experiences for artists within those three genres that I just mentioned. So definitely. Dope, man, dope. Are there any artists right now in Philly that you're really watching as they as they bloom? Yeah, um, I'm wa I'm watching Brianna Cash, who um, was recently signed to Interscope. Um, she had a, her single came out January 17th, "Numb" featuring Tory Lanez. Uh, Sim Santana is a, is a is a rapper that I'm looking you know looking at. I think he's really dope. Um, and just a few others. There's always like those that I see around the city who I just really respect. There's Suzanne Christine's of the world, um, you know, Jacqueline Constance, Constance's of the world. Like those are artists that I just see continue to to you know thrive in that Philly tradition of just great music. And so always have respect for for a lot of musicians here in the city. Absolutely, absolutely. And then Gab, for you, you know, you just worked on a project with Victoria's Secret about a, what two months ago? Or yeah, not two well, months ago. we shot it in August, and it launched on Victoria's Secret about two months ago. Yeah. Awesome. So. What are some cool projects you you have going on, and or you recently worked on? Well, that's my coolest project, and it's probably Fire. going to be my coolest project for the rest of my life. So I'm not even going to deny that. But um, no, I do a lot of makeup brands. So I've done it cosmetic, Becca, Bare Minerals, that kind of stuff. 
Um, and then I do a lot of commercial lifestyle stuff. So I'm sure you've seen my face in very embarrassing places. I do like Tempur-Pedic mattress commercials, Ashley Furniture. Well, my... Tempur-Pedic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've probably seen me on TV doing something really dumb, but <laughs> it pays the bills, right? But uh, my... I, yeah. I used to be... I was in a Foreman Mills commercial. as one of my first jobs. As a For my Foreman Mills! Mills. <laughs> Stretch those bills. Like, that was me, legit, like, in a, in a commercial in Baltimore, like, crazy. I'm oh trying to think God. if I saw it. <laughs> no, my debut job was for um, Conair, so Conair, the hair company, and they put me on packaging of a headband. And the headband, you could wear it five different ways, and whoever was the creative director of packaging did an awful job. They had five pictures of me wearing the headband five different ways on this, like, six-inch, I don't even know, package with this headband hanging down. And um, that was my debut thing. And it's in CVS now and Ulta. And if you ever walk by and see a ridiculous package, it's me. <laughs> awesome. So the Philly creative scene, what I'm hearing from all of you is that it's vibrant, right? There's community amongst it. There's some amazing people in here that are in the Philly music scene. I got Branford out here. Shout out to him. Um, what do you guys feel like is happening in terms of the money? Is the money following the, the activity, right? Do you guys feel supported from a resource perspective? And, and I'll give context to that, right? Like, you know, shout out to, to Dave uh, and also to Will Toms, right, from Rec Philly. They're doing amazing work in the city. They got an event tonight as well, so that, that's really cool to check out after this too. Um, but like, I, I love watching what they've been able to do in Center City with the space, having live events, bringing in work, people to do workshops that are really doing the work. What do, you, what do you guys feel in terms of the money behind the movement? Is it, is it following it fast enough? Okay, well, I will say I graduated from Temple. I was homecoming queen. Shout out to TU. Shout out. And um, I had a minor in Fox School of Business, entrepreneurship. And what I will say is um, from an institution aspect, they're definitely putting money behind pushing entrepreneurs and building that. Um, as far as the creative scene, um, they're not there yet, but what I will say is the intentionality is there. The focus, the drive um, is there. So I definitely feel like the potential is crazy. But right now, it's almost like the seeds have been planted and like the sprout is like just at the surface of the soil. But I definitely think that people are putting energy and time and money into it. So years from now, We'll definitely reap the benefits of that. Got you. you <clears throat> I'm coughing. You pick it up. <laughs> Get some water. You know it's water. Um, so I think there's still too many creatives that move out to L.A., move to different places instead of staying here and really cultivating. But part of the problem, and I'll use music as an example, like we don't have a record label here, like a like a national, like a universal subsidiary or Warner Music. Like we don't have anything real here. We have Philly International Records and then we didn't have anything after that. So I think part of it is, unfortunately, some gatekeepers have to put more into the city so that more people will wanna stay and, and, and thrive here. I think the creative economy is building slowly, but it's not quick enough. You know, I don't want my good friend Gabby to say, hey, it's the new Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna keep coming back to that. But like, um, but no. But no, I don't, but, but that, my point is, but to your point, I mean, Atlanta is thriving in every sector, like, and they put a lot of money, I know the, the city puts a lot of money into their entertainment, a lot of money into fashion, a lot of money into it, and we don't do that here. So I think there's still a disconnect, particularly with people in power, where they could invest some money. I know David O is doing a couple of things, and um, I know, I think it's Daryl Clark, or Daryl, I hope I don't mess up his name, but I mean, it's trying to do something, but it's it's not enough, and that's part of it. That's part of the problem, because there's a certain, to me, is a threshold of being a creative, and then where do you go um, once you get to a certain point? And I put that on Live Nation in Philly. I do. I put it on, on the Live Nations of the world as well. We need to support and do better, do a better job of supporting our creatives here instead of just booking XYZ person because they're hot. We should cultivate emergent acts here, and we don't do enough of that. But we will. Go ahead. So kind of going off what he said, when I mentioned how Urban Outfitters is based in Philly, they don't hire Philly models. 
So they bring their models in from New York and LA. So it's really hard to put money into the fashion industry because it's all independently owned companies. But like I'm saying, uh, Philly's a really great stepping stone for people who are trying to get started. The only issue is, and I'm guilty of this too, I had to branch out elsewhere. Um, I'm fortunate because New York is so close and that is the biggest market in the world for fashion. But a lot of people in New York kind of are like, oh, Philly's up and coming, you know, there's new designers in here, what everything. But um, it's just a weird situation to be in because I know that Philly has a ton of potential and I know that there's a lot of smaller designers and models that are starting out here. But at one point I feel like, and I felt this way too, I felt like I was trapped because there just wasn't enough for me. So there's about 30 clients I have in Philly and that's it, which is not a lot. And you go to New York, you can have thousands of clients. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit difficult. Do you feel that that's, there's a, a little bit of a tie between that and maybe a lack of respect for the creators? Um, and what, what I mean by that is, even my experience in Philadelphia, like coming out of school, started a business here, we were getting buzz, getting traction, um, <coughs> starting to raise the capital, but there was, no, there was no real activity behind that in Philly, right? Like, like we were told from Philly heads, go elsewhere to get the capital and then come back. And I said, like, well, why would we come back if we get money from somewhere else? And so from a tech perspective, you know, we watch companies leave here, whether that was companies like um, Venmo that went to New York and then got acquired by PayPal, um, whether that was Warby Parker in the glasses business, right? Like there were pen guys, they were out here and, and the city wasn't necessarily full force behind them in terms of capital. And so you have this kind of brain drain that happens even though there's so much mental capital in the city because of the universities that make the city what it is, right? Um, so from that perspective, and talking about sometimes the dearth, that lack of capital, do you feel like there's a slight lack of respect? Do you feel like you have to go somewhere else, prove you're amazing somewhere else, once you get that love, then pe people in Philly go, oh, I love Gab, I love Diamond, I love Brandon, right? Like, what do you feel about that? Yes. Literally just yes. <laughs> Charges to the game. I mean, people like glitz and glam, it is what it is, but I will say in the in the like the underground art scene and like tell me how you feel Brandon it's a certain type of respect that you get from people like the roots the Jill Scott like it's a certain type of like Philly like oh you got it from Philly like it's this is the tough this is one of the toughest cities yeah. to make it in and I was fortunate because I started out under the the business management firm for Jill Scott and the roots actually um and Kanye West at the time and so you know, I was able to attach myself to certain names, so people gave me a certain level of credibility or respect because I know if I was just Joe Blow at another business management firm's like whatever, and you, I would have to go to New York or I have to go to LA. I've been really fortunate. I've never moved, you know, as I've grown in this, you know, whatever this role is in, in music. Um, but I know a lot of people that do, and then they come back, and then all of a sudden it's, oh, here's so and so, you're so great. And I think Philly does not support Philly enough as much as other cities like the like and I'm gonna I'm with her right now now I agree like Atlanta supports Atlanta su Atlanta supports Atlanta I've seen it in in tech you know I've watched their tech scene grow yeah. exponentially yeah, all, like, Paul judge it, and yeah. you know what I mean I've seen the gathering spot like what what they've been able to do in different sectors and we need to get there and we're not there yet and it's you know I think I, and I put it on me and I put it on others like we have to do better a better job of making sure we support and keep growth going and that's why I respect what Dave and Will are doing um, you know they include educational opponent components because one of the major elements of why people don't get to certain levels in their career is access and, and it's access particularly for black and brown kids and young people understanding where they could be or what they can do or how they can get there because they don't have the mentors or mentorship to, to get to where they need to be and so we need to do a better job here in Philadelphia of being those mentors, of being those people to help them achieve. Got you. I mean, that's, that's real. That's real. Um, each of you individually, what do you guys plan to do over the next two, three years uh, to solidify yourselves and also to solidify that connection you have in Philadelphia? Gab, you want to start first? Sure. So uh, I think Philly will forever be home, and it'll be a place that I will probably never leave, even though I work in Manhattan like four times a week. Um, I refuse to move there because it's just not authentic enough for me. But um, I saw how, when I first started modeling, I started in Philly five years ago. Um, I was with an agency called Reinhardt, and I still am, and they're Philly's number one and main modeling agency. 
And I just kind of saw all the girls who were my group and how they either completely stopped modeling because they were discouraged because there wasn't a ton of clients or how they are now the faces of IMG. IMG is the biggest agency in the world. So they're the girls that are walking for Givenchy and Prada, that kind of stuff. How there's Reinhardt girls that are literally walking for these big designers. So I think in, with time, I'm not sure if it's two, three, five years from now when I'm done my modeling, I kind of want to flip the switch and I want to be a mother agent. So what a mother agent is, is they take these girls who have modeling potential or they're just, there's just something about them that they can do well. And I teach them how to walk, talk, pose, you know, I set them up for these shoots and then I ultimately, you know, sign them wherever. But I don't like how these mo these mother agents now have to send their girls to New York or LA. I want it to be like a Philly thing. So I want to bring more just girls here and models here so that designers can open up these businesses or different companies can come to Philly and shoot because what a lot of people do now is they have their photo shoots in Philly instead of New York because it's a lot cheaper. So we have the talent and the quality, so might as well just kind of make it a permanent thing. Hey. Brandon? I think continuing on that on that um, that word access. So I have a nonprofit, and we teach students about the business of of music, um, because what we see is a lot of our young people want to be rappers or want to be athletes, but don't understand you could be a business manager or you can be an investor. You know what I mean? You can be certain things in in the industry, and so it'll be continuing to do that to teach. You know what I mean? And it's middle school and high school students here in Philadelphia, and it's like, what is the point of the Roots Picnics of the world if I can't bring 10 young people there so they can be backstage and understand production and understand how we put on these large festivals. It's small things. I mean, they may not necessarily want to be in the music industry, but if you learn marketing and music, you can apply what you learn there into other fields as well. So it's just doing those types of things to help kids. And the, you know, it's really about access for me because I feel like if you don't have it, you don't know what you can be. Well, and, and a big part of the idea of access, right, is, is your job is necessarily to teach someone everything in one setting. It's to spark the curiosity that lets them go on and want to keep doing everything they can, overturn every stone to learn that thing and create that, that, that um, process for them, right? Or find that passion for themselves. Uh, Diamond, how about yourself? Um, I definitely agree with what both of you said. Uh, for me, at Temple a few years ago, I was the president of an organization called Art of Business, Business of Art my co is out there, but, um, and it really sparked for me, like, wow, there are so many talented artists, and that's outside the realm of visual, but um, that just don't have the tools or the know-how to, like, actually make money with their art. Like, you know, it's like they're sitting on, like, tons of artwork and like don't know how to get it out there and I think part of the reason is like as far as visual artists a lot of studio artists are just naturally introverted they're they put so much energy into their art that when it comes to the rest if it's not dealt by dealt with by someone else it's not dealt with at all you know so they get stuck in just being a studio artist so I'm really passionate about bridging the gap between art and business kind of similar to what he said but just specifically for artists like now is the time like digital arts is booming you know what i mean like art is jay-z dropped the 444 everybody want to paint and you know what i mean so it's like now is the time where they learn these skills and one great access is like rec philly Re just connecting them with resources and pushing them like you say to make that spark so so what would what would your advice be to people in the audience in terms of finding their passion um, but then executing, because the thing about it is like, um, like if you go to school, let's say even high school, and you leave after that, go into the real world, you go to college, leave after that, go into the real world, the hard thing is once you find yourself in a job, you know, and, and you're not passionate about that job, it can, it, once it's paying your bills, it can be very hard to divert away from that to focus on something else that might be really driving you, right, or inspiring you. Um, and I feel very uniquely blessed because I was able to figure out something I loved while I was in school. So coming out of it, yeah, it was years of hardship, years of extending the idea of being broke from like 22 to beyond, right? But I've never felt empty in that process. I've always felt full. I've always felt happy as a result, even when things are extremely tough. And so you guys have all had different walks of life that you're currently living in, currently manifesting in real, in real time. 
what it, what would that advice be to someone else uh, to ensure that, and, and that's not to say you can't have a nine to five and be very passionate about it, right? But how do you find that is, is my, I guess, my question. Um, for me, what just popped in my head is that you can look without being lost. So I think a lot of times in this generation, whether it's social media or people try to confine you into this box or the generation of our parents is like, do this one linear thing and to get to A. It's like our success is so nonlinear and it's just we create, like I saw a tweet, like millennials will quit their jobs in two seconds. Like we're all about fulfillment and passion. It's like it's okay to be multiple things at once. You know, it's like you don't have to fit in this box. You don't have to do it this way. And don't let like the way you look kind of stop you from following what you want to do to kind of keep up a facade. You know what I mean? So um, that's just one thing, like try things. Like try 10 things, try 15, try 30. Like it doesn't mean you're lost. It just means you're looking, you know? So if I, if I dig on that a little bit just from, and I don't want to lose the, the main question, but it makes me think about something else. So we are in a society where millennials, Gen Z, we, it's, like, it's, boy, it's, it's like a microwave, right? We want things fast. We want things that happen for us. So it's like the same energy of like we're there two seconds and we're out. It's like I'm not saying it's bad, but there's levels to it, right? Because um, what each of you guys just explained a second ago in terms of your long-term view are things that they're your long-term view, and then you're going to have to wait even longer to see the results for each thing you guys said, right? Because you're investing in young people or youthful ideas that need to manifest. So think of, I mean, at, at, with that part, yeah, how do you think about how millennials and Gen Z should approach it? That, what I said specifically, is to those people who don't know what they want to do. Because the fact of the matter is 90% of people don't. And even when they say, yeah, I do, in the back of their head, they're like, but I still want to do this other thing, you know? So that just goes to them as far as don't be afraid to try new things. And even if you might not, like, most people don't have their niche. We're young. Like, you know what I mean? They don't. Like, you have the rest of your life. But it's like, don't feel defeated or don't feel undervalued just because you're not attached to this one cause or this one specific career or this one company or this one, like, you know, find value in yourself and find value in not microwave mentality popcorn in, but but trying new things because once you find that thing that's your thing you're gonna know it like you know and, and from there it's off whether it's hard or not it's like you're so fulfilled that you know that's the thing but it's like if you keep trying to stick with stuff for the sake of sticking with it it's like intentional commitment you know what i mean so that's that's as far as that goes Come to me last. Come to me last. All right. This is a tough one. Well, for me, I I think it took me four years to get my big break. And once I did, it was everything just fell into place. So for four years, I struggled. I had the worst bookings ever. I think the like the most money I made in a booking was like two grand for four years, which sucks. I'll just be honest with you. Um, and then I think once I had that moment where, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what happens when you stick it out and you really work hard and you, you know, have this perseverance because this is what I wanted to do. So I think if anything I could tell anyone, you know, just don't give up. If that's what you're really passionate about, just follow it. And it kind of stinks looking back that it took four years for my big break, but I wouldn't redo it though. So I think that's kind of like, if you're really into something, just stick in it, you know? I have a question. For the two grand um, job you booked, at that point, was that the biggest like biggest name client you'd ever worked for? No. So I'm about to drop some information. Uh, the other day, I got a request for a job. And the job was for CoverGirl. And CoverGirl wanted to pay their models $500. So you'd be super, super surprised. All these big names think that these girls are desperate. Like, they're going to do it for the, the resume. But um, that's kind of like the biggest misconception ever with modeling. Not because, and I asked that, and I, I'm, you know, not glad you said that, but that's the truth, right? Like, I, in my own career, a lot of the bigger names, you, the the energy is you get to leverage my name. That's the energy. The smaller boutique kind of vibes or shows, they're the ones that'll sometimes shout out a couple thousand dollars because they appreciate you wearing their clothes. They appreciate you being in, in their vibe in their vicinity. They value you. They value you. So like that cover girl. Yeah. Sorry, cover girl, whatever. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? They're going to $500 and everything I make and every other model gets 20% of that taken out to their agent. So you don't even make $500. That's how just absurd it is. 
It's the same way in music. I'm sorry. I, I know you asked the question, but it's the same way. Like Live Nation will pay a certain amount for an artist, whereas they could go somewhere else and they'll get more because they'll value them more. Live Nation's like, well, if you're not here, I'll just replace you with XYZ artist like and, and doesn't care. It's just fascinating. We don't do that at Live Nation Urban because we are a different uh <laughs> you I don't wanna you know? <laughs> Yeah, let me delineate that. But no, um that's a tough question, man. Like it's tough because um they they called me out on my BS. Um they <laughs> um <laughs> it's tough because I've known what I wanted to do since I was like eleven. Like I knew I wanted to be in music and entertainment. Like I've always known that. So that it's tougher for me because I know a lot of people still at my age that do not know what they want to do. I'll, I'll recommend because what the term is solopreneurship. You know where everyone will have is there's an um, article I read and it said like 60% of people by 2026 will will have side hustles. Will all have a side. You know they will have side hustles. And I, I recommend that if you haven't found your passion. But I also from a passion perspective. Don't let money guide you because money's going to come like, you know, it, it'll be there. But when you get detracted because you're not making enough, then you lose sight of what you want to do. I, I have so many stories of people that, well, damn, I wish I would have stuck it out, you know, because this is what I really love. And I remember people closest to me like, you know, I'll keep it real. It was like my mother. It was. You know, my grandfather, like, looking at me crazy. You know, I you know, I wear glasses. I went to Penn. Like, you know, like, and so they were like, well, why aren't you a doctor or a lawyer? Like, what are you doing? Music's a hobby. Like, what what the hell are you doing? And so you you kind of have to have blinders on. And, and excuse me for, you know, anyone's um, religious beliefs at this point, but I feel like we all have, you know, God in us. And so if that is the case, then why not show or display our greatness? Like, it does not matter what other people say or what other people do, because if you know you, you're, you're good. Like, you're going to be good. And I just think we get so lost in, especially now, social media and Instagram. Oh, God, you see somebody fronting like a, like a bleep. <laughs> fronting, <laughs> like a bleep. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> fronting, like, and you see that, and you're like, damn, I'm not there yet, and they're my age, and that's not it at all. Like, that's not your journey. It's... Just respect your journey, respect what you want to do, love what you want, whatever you're going to do, love the love the shit out of it and just go with it. Like that's that's it. And, and so to, to kind of round things out, you know, I want to actually touch on that social media thing you mentioned, right? So I was watching a documentary last week, talked about influencers, it was on Hulu, it focused on influencers and their social media relationship to it. Um, and, and the idea of what is happiness and, and how do we derive that and or, or look at that. And one of, the, one of the things that was pointed out was a lot of times when you think about disappointment is because there's an expectation that's here and what you, what you achieve or whatever is down here. So there's a gap, and that's what creates that disappointment, um, and which then creates people not being happy, right? And the, the, that, was, that metaphor was used for then in social media. We can all look to someone that's our age, around our peer set, what have you, on, online, and seemingly their life is way better. They're traveling all over the world. Um, they have no cares in the world. They're just getting to live life. You ever, you ever see the people, person that travels so much, but there's like no job, and you're like, what do you do? Like, like I've been there you know? and done that. I've been right. Like right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like when we people see that stuff, and then they look at their own life, and they're behind a computer, or they're working, you know, at something somewhere arduous with their hands, and they're like, that's not that's not my reality. That's not what I see. That creates a lot of disappointment. And you know, suicide rates and, and are, are up drastically since 2000. And theoretically, you're supposed to be freer now than ever before in our entire existence. And yet, people are very sad. And I, I think it, it has a lot to do, like a huge part to do with social media. Um, and they, on the documentary, they had Sean Parker, former president of Facebook, founder of Napster. And he was like, yo, like, we constructed it like this. Like, as a coder, we, we, we preyed on people's lowest psychological denominator. And we, we knew that if we're in your notifications, somebody liked your thing, somebody commented, somebody did this, you're constantly going to be glued to this device. And it's worked to the point where they, a lot of them don't even use social media, right? Like, it's the, it's the idea of, like, you don't, you, don't, you don't get high on your own supply, right? That whole vibe. And so what do you, I mean, what do you guys do to refill yourselves? What does that process look like when you do have a hard day, when you don't land the job you were, you know, you you carved out that you wanted? What does that process look like for each of you? I'll go first. So um, with modeling, I follow a lot of models, and I can tell you that 
Instagram is such a fake world. It is unbelievable. I'll see girls. We'll be at a casting. So when you go to a casting, there can be a hundred girls next to you and there'll be like a casting director and there'll be lights and the cameras and everything. And I'll watch the girl next to me, take a picture and post like on set right now with the person we're on a casting for. She didn't book that job, but she's posting that. So all her followers think she booked that job because they don't know the difference. They're not going to be there anyway. So, and it's just crazy because I, I've just was always an outsider and I don't have a ton of Instagram followers. I mean, when I go to a casting, the girl next to me can have a hundred thousand and I barely have 6,000 followers. So if you want to follow me on Instagram later, but, um, it's just, it's their lives and they care more about their social media appearance. And to me, I think that's just crazy. Like I have finally said, you know what? That's crazy. It's not real life. And I think seeing people do that, knowing like that's not the case at the moment, it's kind of humbled me. It's like, you know what, Gab? They're not booking that job or maybe they did book that job and good for them. But like I said, like your time will come too. So I kind of just realized that Instagram is not real. It's just not real. So if I just tell myself it's not real, it, it doesn't affect me that much. And one thing I've noticed about you as well, like the, the world of modeling can be very vain, right? Like that just comes with it. But like you, you're from Delco, right? I'm from Delco. Yeah. I was born in Clifton Heights, raised in Marple Newtown. <laughs> but like even just your social media presence, you incorporate your friends a lot, right? And you reference Delco a lot. And you know, it's like just a girl from Delco doing this or that, right? And I think there's a, there's a grounding that comes, or you can see that grounding when someone's that open about where they're from and how far they've come right definitely and i think that i try to be as open as possible just with everything in my life um, and i don't think that just because i'm a model i have to act like i'm better than anyone because i'm not i st i graduated from temple in may and moved home with my parents i'm not kidding i share a room with my 16 year old sister so if anyone is more humble than me it is me but it's crazy because you know, tomorrow I'll be in New York City doing a campaign. So things like that. And when I go there and I tell these people like, oh, well, I live in Philly, work in New York, you should see the looks on their faces. They're like, what? So it's, I take pride in that almost. It was, it was interesting. You, you touched on, you know, we're talking about social media. I remember, remember it was recently when they were going to take away the likes from Instagram and people went crazy. Like what, like, well, what are you posting pictures for so that other people can make you feel better the, the endorphins about the, the it's, it's interesting it's interesting for me it's just um i have a, a strong and I'm, I'm really blessed for this strong group of people around me that i've known forever whether that's family or friends that will keep me humble like that will still remind me of that time that i broke my glasses when i was whatever like shut the hell up like you know what i mean like, i think it's good to have people around you to keep you in in, in a certain perspective and at the same time I step away from things at, at moments where it just gets too much. Like I'm always on the phone. There's always something going on. So I'll sit and just silence and just sit. Just, you know, it could be 20 minutes, 30 minutes just to reflect on my life, like my day or whatever it is that can just keep me centered because there's always something going on. There's so much stimuli, um, particularly in music. And so I just, um, I just try to chill, man, because you can't let this um, affect you too much or let it get to you because I hang around a bunch of artists and things and you and you, you we're, we're social media friends like you you'll never see me with an artist or anyone because it's I'm a star too like we're all the same you just happen to have a lot more in your bank account than I do um but outside of that we're the same like we're people like I'm not like I don't care like f you so that's it <laughs> Diamond, what do you think? Um, well, for me, um, I know I'm an artist, but I actually went to Temple and I uh, graduated my advertising degree, so I'm very much in the digital marketing realm. And I definitely agree and acknowledge all of the painful truths about um, social media and what it does to you. But also, it's just important to use it as a tool. Like, look, it, it could either use you or you could use it. And that's how I look at it, because it's definitely power in it. You just can't let it take power of you. And I think that's ultimately what it is. Because to like throw away Instagram and say we're done with it is like it's a whole world economy based off yeah, of yeah, Instagram. It's like million dollar accounts. So um, that and then also for me personally, I deliberately set time a lot time where I will not be on my phone. So like in the morning when I wake up, I will not get on my phone until I'm in my day. It's just certain habits and like um, 
observing yourself if y'all go on the phone in the settings and tell us how much time you're on instagram look at it it will scare you and you will get your act together like you know like when you're seeing all the time spent on there that you could be doing productive things it's like really reevaluate where your time is being spent and where or like what are you getting out of it you know so um yeah that's what i do but put the phone down yeah. Yeah, I, no, I agree with a lot of things you guys said. Um, for me, it's, it's I'm big on family, I'm big on friends, I'm big on prayer, I'm big on the idea of when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I refuse to do is check my phone, because it's so easy to roll over and just pop over Instagram. And I still check, I'll catch myself, like I'll roll over and be like, wait, what am I doing, right? And for me, if I just start my day with a prayer, just like with gratitude for where I'm at, gratitude the fact that I can open my eyes, and gratitude for like whatever the day's gonna hold, right? Like, even if like, if, if you ask me, I would have, of course, loved to fill this entire room out. The reality is everybody in this room right now is supposed to be here right now. And everyone here is supposed to receive whatever message it is you're supposed to receive. And so for me, I just feel like every moment is such a blessed moment. And I have friends that pour into me, I have family that pours into me, and I show up for them the same way, or at least I strive to every single day. Um, and I think that if I, if, I, if I know I'm putting my best foot forward in that regard, I'm good. I'm a star too, right? So that's what it is. But guys, I appreciate you guys being here tonight. How can people find you and stay connected with you guys? Brandon. And, and now we're going to follow each other on Instagram. <laughs> um, <Right>. my, my, <laughs> my Instagram is uh, Brandon underscore Panky, P-A-N-K-E-Y. All right. So my Instagram, I'm sorry that I started this, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> my Instagram is G-P-A-O-L. Try to keep it short and sweet. My Instagram is annoying because it starts with an underscore, but you can find me at D W H P P D Whip. Yep. Dope. I appreciate you guys. This is one of the humblest crews, uh, honestly, that I know. They're all doing amazing things, and so shout out to that. Um, my name is Ofo. As you know, I'm the host of the WYL Take Ownership podcast, where we're all about taking ownership of your mental, your economics, and your community. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.